In this video, I'm going to respond to a question regarding the difference between being a doormat and not having to be around abusive people. So we want to clarify, based on scripture, what does scripture have to say? Dear Carrie, I have a question. I read in a soul line, page 37, that we're not required to engage with abusers after rebuke if they don't repent, including change. So repentance includes change. So how do you contrast that with being a doormat, not being offended, or enduring persecution, which we are called to bear? At what age is a child liable for abuse they cause? Oh, okay. I'm reading a, the personal part of this, which I'm going to leave out, of course. Uh, and what, what she's asking about, because I thought uh, for a minute I when I read that, I thought she was talking about uh, a child causing themselves to be abused. With, that's not what she's saying. She's talking about abuse that a child is actually um, engaging in, like the child is abusive. So she goes on to describe a 14-year-old who is emotionally abusive and physically destroys things. That child is liable the minute that they start to abuse. When my daughter was, uh, you know, like teething and she bit, she was held accountable. But they have to be held accountable according to their age, but they most definitely are held accountable. If you're asking at what age you dust your feet from a child, um, as a parent, you need to take responsibility for your part in creating that mess. So she's not the parent of this person. And it turns out the person taking care of this child is not even the parent. And I'm going to be really honest about that. If a parent is capable of taking care of their child, they need to be taking care of the child that God gave them. There needs to be parental involvement. I don't believe in just handing your kids off because, you know, somebody else is willing. And I don't think God believes in that either if he gave, if he deemed that someone is to be the parent of that child. So as I'm reading the message, what I'm reading is that this child refuses to go anywhere else, even for a day. These are not on the child. These are on the people taking care of that child. Children are going to do what they are allowed to do. And if you're learning anything in your, in your, um, you know, the work that we do in Heart Known series, you should be able to recognize the critical role of the parent and that it doesn't do anyone a service for a parent to indulge a child. That child needs structure. And I would say that if you have taken in a child and the option is things either go this way here or you go somewhere else and that child wants to be with you, that should be a great motivator and leverage. These are logical consequences. You have to teach children logical consequences. Just because they're coming from a bad situation is not an excuse to indulge them. They don't know what to do with that. And, and really what's happening is they're going from one situation where they're not cared for to another situation where they're not cared for. Indulging is not love. Now, as I'm reading the details of this situation, which I'm not going to get into, it sounds like both parents are out of the picture and are in trouble with the law. I would, not, I would want to be very careful not to be holding a threat over a child, but to provide logical consequences to behavior. So it sounds to me like the cops have been called because this child is so out of control and the person taking care of him does not have custodial rights. A logical consequence to this happening, and you may think that this is not nice, but the logical consequence is that this child's going to get taken away again and go to another home. And this is not helpful to him. So he needs to be sat down with, and it needs to be explained to him that this cannot be. But there also needs to be, what I'm seeing, is excuses for the child's behavior. We all have our reasons for why we are the way we are, but excuses never helped anybody. So stop with the excuses, the diagnoses and everything else. You got reasons and that, that child needs to understand those reasons why he's struggling with certain things. They need not be excuses. You don't explain them to him as excuses. You explain them to, to him as we all got our stuff. Here are some things that you're struggling with. Here are some things that happened while you were inside your mommy's tummy. And I'm here to trudge it with you, but I'm not going to put up with abuse. If you start engaging in abusive behavior, here is the consequence. You don't get to stay here. You don't get to stay here and keep doing that because if you have an excuse that you are too out of control, then you need to go to a place where they can control you. But if you would like to live in a place where you're loved and you're given the freedom and structure to grow into a functional adult, 
and have a loving family, then you're welcome to stay here and we will love you. And God is most certainly capable of helping you with any difficulties that you have because he knows those difficulties. He knows what he has sent and he knows what he's building you with. And I'll trudge that with you. This child is 14 years old. He's able to receive that, that communication. And then you lay out the rules and you need to have clear rules. Here are the expectations. Here's the way that we're going to measure them by the end of the week. If anything happens in that time, you're going to be writing about it and we're going to have a conversation. So the template that I use, I'm trying to remember the template that I used with my daughter and that I've shared with others, but um, I would have them write, what was it? What was the behavior that they got in trouble for? What was it that they did? What were they trying to accomplish? And what did it result in instead? What do they need to do differently in order to, you know, if they want to accomplish that thing, what do they need to do differently? And do they need to repent? What do they need to do to repent? Now, remember the definition of repentance. Repentance is I've examined myself. I admit what I've done with God. I receive his ministry. And then I need to bear the fruit of change. If you don't have the fruit of change, you don't have repentance. Just like if you don't have the fruit of works, you don't have faith. John the Baptist says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The fruit of repentance is that you change and that you are growing in God, that you're receiving his ministry and you are on an upward trajectory of change. And so if this is the expectation you have of yourself, it should be the expectation you have of others with whom you're in a relationship. The word does not say that you have to be in a relationship with everybody. You have a choice here. You do not have to have a 14 year old in a house who is abusive and destroying things. You don't, you don't have to have that unless that's your own 14 year old that God has placed you over then you need to take responsibility for being a parent. And I think in this situation, if you're the one in the parental role, you need to have that conversation. But there is a logical conversation that needs to happen. This child has been placed in your care. He can be placed in somebody else's care if he's going to continue this behavior. And he needs to have a bracing reality check about that. He is not entitled. Now, if that sounds harsh to you, how does God treat us in these situations. He will be our father. He will remain in that temple and his eyes will be on that temple. As long as what? As long as you don't go serve other gods, as long as you don't do these other behaviors, his eyes and his heart will always be there. Our father gives us logical consequences to behavior. So if we reject him and we want another master, he hands us over to that other master. If you don't parent in this way, if you don't help them to understand that there are logical consequences to behavior, they're not going to be able to conceive of God. They're not going to be able to accept that God has consequences for us. And thus you have all of counterfeit Christianity right now saying, no, God doesn't punish. God doesn't give us consequences. Have you watched the way that I handle things in the assembly, in the workshops, on the channel? Have you seen the way that I've handled things? Do I allow people to just hang out who are abusive to me? No, and I don't even let them in the assembly because those who are abusive are certainly not circumcised in heart. Now, a child needs help being able to do that, and I think it would be a wonderful thing if you, if this person was able to mentor this child and set up some good structure. That would be a wonderful thing, but it's not an entitlement. Kids are not entitled to their cell phones. They're not entitled to anything. They need to learn how to earn. They need to learn that good behavior is rewarded and that bad behavior is punished. That's how our father parents us. He does not have a middle ground. Good behavior, obedience is rewarded and blessed. Bad behavior, disobedience is punished. If you raise up your children that way, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Psychology likes to make this very, very complicated and add in all of these diagnoses and these complications and, you know, everything else. It's not complicated. I'm telling you right now, it is not complicated. I speak to you very directly. You know, I didn't, I didn't need to, you know, figure out each of your diagnoses and your situations. God testifies to it when it's true. 
So you have God on your side. If you want to do things the way that the world does things with medications and diagnoses and special situations, I mean, go ahead, make it complicated. But it's very, very clear in God. Do things the way he established it and he will make it work. He will conform all things for the good of those who love him. Now, I want to tell you something else. This, I know that this person is not the parent of this child, but they got into the situation somehow. And the way they got into the situation is their responsibility. For example, you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't take care of their kids and they won't let you discipline them. Now you need to go deal with your sin with God of why you ended up in that relationship and why you're putting up with that. There is no doubt that God had you in that situation to build you, maybe even to take care of this child, to take this child on. And still, you ended up in this situation. You need to go deal with your sin because that sin is now affecting the child. And now that child knows that there's a version of you that doesn't hold them accountable at all. Why the heck would they want this new version? And that's going to be really difficult to transition into unless you have God, unless you are standing true in what God has built in you and standing confident in what you're doing, that it's the right thing and that it's what he's telling you to do. If you're being triggered by these children, which it's pretty easy to be triggered by children, you need to have a way of dealing with that. You need to have a way of dealing with your own feelings and being able to heal in that. Now, I'm also seeing that the police have been involved and they say this is a family matter, even though this person does not have custodial rights. That's a lie. They need to call, C they need to call uh, CPS or DCFS, whatever they call it in your area. That is one way to get, no one, if, if you don't have custodial rights, you don't have a legal right to these kids, no one can force you to take care of someone's kid. That doesn't even make sense. But again, you have to make the decision about, are you going to take care of this child to the extent that you're giving them an opportunity? Are you capable? Do you have it in you to be able to take care of them and give them the structure that they need? Because this is a child who's already been rejected by one set of parents. He doesn't, they don't need to be rejected by another. It's one thing to, if you have determined that you have the resources to be able to take care of that child and that you're invested in it, and that God has told you this is what you are to do, then you sit down with the child and you say, look, this is what I'm able to do. This is what I am willing to invest in as long as you do your part. There's nothing wrong with that, especially with a teenage child. But listen, if you're not willing to do your healing work, they are never going to be able to heal, and this is not going to be a good situation for either one of you. Each of you needs to be doing your work. Each of you needs to be doing your part. All right, let's go back to the original question because now that we know that this has to do with the child, it kind of changes the dynamics a little bit, right? In the word, again, what are we told? We're told reprove, then reprove again. You know, if, if someone doesn't listen, and this is referring to in the body, like this is referring to those who are claiming to be of God. Reprove once, if they don't listen, reprove again, bringing a witness, and the third time, rebuke. Third time, they're done. Like they need to, they need to go deal with their consequences because they've demonstrated that they don't, they do not have a spirit of self-control inside of them. So she says, I read in a, a soul aligned page 37 that we're not required to engage with abusers after rebuke if they don't repent in which includes change. How do you contrast that with being a doormat, not being offended or enduring persecution, which we are called to bear now in terms of the, the word doesn't talk about not being a doormat, but not being offended or enduring persecution, which we are called to bear. Those are all things that are happening outside. So these are not people, we don't choose to hang out with people with whom we're not in agreement. It's not like we go and hang out there. We don't go and hang out with our enemies. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about who you're choosing to be part of your family. We're talking about a role that you're taking on that you need to go and discern Am I supposed to be in this role? Am I, am I taking away from the two people that you chose to be the parents of this child that they need to go and like do their job or fight for their rights or whatever it is? Should I be in this role at all? Is this what you want me to do? Listen, Mordecai took care of Esther, but Esther was not behaving this way, right? And her, her parents had, had passed away. That's really the only example I can think of. There, I don't, there really aren't examples of like unruly kids that were being taken care of. In fact, the unruliness, like such as in the case of Eli, who was not managing his house well, God held him accountable. And he said, I'm going to destroy your entire house. 
So it falls on the parent. And if you've stepped into a parent role, you got to get it under wraps. I personally, this is the way I would handle it. I would start engaging in my own healing work. That needs to happen. You got to figure out why you're being so triggered by this child that you're not able to stand up and be solid as an adult and let him know unwaveringly, this is not going to happen in my house or you're going to have to leave. And all of your privileges are going to be stripped from you. But here's what I expect. And if you do these things, if you obey my commands and keep my decrees, you won't be driven from this land that I've allowed you to possess or that I'm going to give you to possess. If you keep my laws and decrees, you'll be blessed in the land that I'm giving you to possess. Like, do you get the picture about that? God doesn't just say you're only going to be punished for bad behavior. You can't just give that. You need to give both options. Here's what I expect. So you can choose this. This, these are the rules in the house, or you will be totally stripped. You will sit in a room with a mattress and your clothes, and then you will slowly earn your privileges back through good behavior, through obedience to what I have laid out. And that's kind of what God does with us, doesn't he? He strips us down, and then he starts giving us our privileges back one by one as we have earned that trust. I, I, I understand it sounds so harsh in these days where there's just absolutely no accountability whatsoever. My goodness, I think people would explode at the way I was raised. I mean, I don't think it's that unreasonable to explode at the way I was raised. But these are, you know, follow the model of what God has given you. And the reason why I had, why, why I love that essay and my daughter would say, I would rather have my phone taken away. I'd rather, I'd rather have to like eat broccoli for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and to write out that essay. But you know what? I have a daughter who knows how to take stock of who she is, what she's done. She's a beautiful human being and very accountable. Okay, so the template is, what did I do? What was the behavior that got me into trouble? What, what was it that I did? What was I trying to accomplish? What happened instead what should I do differently next time if I want to accomplish that thing, that goal? How do I need to go repent with God now? And do I need to repent with anybody else? And then what do I need to do to change? And don't let them, you know, you know whether your child has really put true effort into that. So if they haven't, let them know. I'm sorry, I don't feel like you put true effort into this. Take another half hour. I'm going to set the timer and then we can talk again. And my daughter will probably tell you, you know, when she was a teenager, she'll probably tell you, I got real good at just, you know, saying what I needed to say. But you know what? The joke's on her because she got real good at actually having to think about what she should say. <laughs> and so either way, they're going to engage in it. Either way. And then the behavior is going to have to follow it up. So either they rein it in real tight. I mean, they can't fake it that much, you know? At some point, something has to change. So... I know your kids are going to be, you know, they might be obnoxious about that and they might say things like that. Like, oh, I just told you what you wanted to hear. The truth is all they're trying to do is uh, maintain their integrity <laughs> to a certain degree. They're trying to like convince themselves that they're still in control. That's okay. Let them. The truth is something's getting in there. Okay, now that we've talked about the basics of just structure, let's talk about feelings for a minute. Because the feelings part of this is incredibly important to you being able to heal and to that child being able to heal. And the traditional approach in like child therapy or child psychology or whatever would be to provide all of these limitations and tough love and to handle this from a behavioral perspective. But the truth is you're not just your behaviors, you're a soul. Something else is going on. So while it's important to set up these uh, safety structures and a structure by which everyone can just live and in harmony and have some order, you have a real situation on your hands here. You're being triggered. So you're being compelled in this situation, which tells me that you have what, what happens when you're compelled. When we're being compelled, it's because the devil has snuck into one of those chinks in our armor. Lukewarm, unresolved, unoccupied. I'm going to guess here that it's unresolved. It may also be lukewarm and unoccupied. You know, when there's unresolved and you start getting pulled back into your flesh, you're unoccupied because you are immediately going into the flesh. And so the devil starts jacking you up and then you behave outside of your integrity 
and the devil knows what he's invested in. Like he knows your weak spots. So he starts poking around and usually he starts poking around through other people. So now you're being attacked and that child's being attacked. And until you seal yourself up, by engaging in a healing, in, in a process of healing, which I outlined for you in Heart Note series, God is not going to seal up those gaps. You have to do the work to be built. And as long as those gaps remain open, your family will never be healed. And you'll never be able to help this child because this child is coming from a really bad situation and undoubtedly is dealing with spirits. All of this is spiritual. You, this, the person who's trying to take care of this child also is probably dealing with spirits. We've all been dealing with spirits. Don't take that personally. Jesus already told us that was the condition that we would be dealing with. But in order for those spirits to be cast out of you, you have to start paying attention to what it is that you're feeling and the design that God has given you. Because in your feelings, you have information. And usually what's happening when you have these big blowups and you have this explosive child and you're, you know, you might start screaming or you might shut down or you might want to run away. And what's happening is you're afraid and you're afraid because you don't have a spirit of self-control. You're afraid because in those moments you have not dealt with your feelings. And so how could you be handed over to any other spirit? You need to be able to have a way of dealing with those feelings. The only thing that, that I, that I can tell you is go to heart known series, unless you have another way of doing this, get involved in that work, start journaling, start dealing with your stuff so that you can start, you know, healing and God will seal up these different places inside of you. I offer a workshop on Monday nights. This Monday, we won't be doing workshop because it's new moon. Um, so we've replaced uh, workshop with new moon uh, because that's what, because God commands new moon and he doesn't command workshop. But start praying and ask God, is this, is this a book that I should be working through? Is this of you? Once you get your own stuff under control, you're going to be able to help this child. But I want to, and, and, and the child truly is probably feeling fear as well. They might seem like an absolute monster. They might seem like they're controlling your life. But really what's probably going with, on with this child is that they're feeling fear. They're feeling totally out of control of themselves. But when you get control of yourself, the devil is going to lose his stronghold in your household. All right. So safety structures first. Those safety structures have to be put in place. If the child is destroying things in the house, first of all, they need consequences. Like they need to know you can't do that and stay here. If you're committed to them being there and they're still doing that, I mean, you can call the police and you can require, you can tell the police that they need to call DCFS because this child is not your child. You do not have legal custody of them and CPS is going to have to come and pick them up. I would hate to see that happen. But it is a logical consequence. If you have sat down with that child and said, you absolutely 100% cannot stay here if you're going to be doing that. If you want to go another route, you can put safety structures up in your house. But see, then you get into some trouble if you're like locking a kid in a room. I don't really think that that's, you know, necessarily the solution to doing that, to locking them like in a padded room or something. I think that what you need to do is sit them down and tell them, like give them a reality check about how things are going to go now and give them a choice. Sit down and talk about the things that they would like to see happen in the house. What is it that they're needing? Make those rules with them. I mean, you're the one who makes the rules, but give them a voice, allow them to participate in what they think is fair. And then you have the final say, write out the expectations, you know, Contrary to what adults think, children want to be involved in that. Like they want a say. They want to be able to have their voice heard. I hope that helps. And the other thing that I would say is you need support. You need to be doing the work in Heart Known series. Uh, I highly suggest that you come to workshop and have that support. And what I mean by support is you don't bring, you don't need to bring the story and all that stuff. If everyone was telling their story, we'd never get through workshop. But you have the support of here's where I'm getting stuck in my work and we can help you and we can share testimony or you can say, you know, this came up this week and here's where I'm stuck. Uh, that is perfectly fine. You have support and you have God. He's the one who knows what he's doing here and he will testify to the work that you're doing and he will make an example of you to your children so that they will want to grow and will be curious about what it is that you're doing. But I, I think at this point, you know, if this is not your child and you are actually putting yourself in danger, 
because if this child, if something happens with this child while they're in your care, because of their out of control behavior, you're going to be held liable for that. So you have to get control of it. But being that this is not your child and you didn't contribute to the problems that are going on, the onus is not on you to fix the situation and where it originated, but the onus is on you to fix, to heal from your own wounds that are causing you to be out of control yourself. So for example, what I mean by that is that same child could have gone in any other household and they could have whipped him into shape and said, hey, you want to stay here? These are the rules. You will be allowed to stay here as long as you abide by these rules, as long as you obey and you'll have privileges and you'll be rewarded. But if you don't, you won't. And not only will you not have those privileges and rewards, but you will be punished. How does our father deal with us? He doesn't say, well, don't worry if, okay, so like, these are my statutes. These are my decrees. These are my laws. Uh, you need to obey them or you're not going to get your rewards. But if you don't obey them, then, you know, you'll just, um, not get anything. No, he, if you don't obey them, you'll be punished. That's what he says. And then psychology comes around and is like, oh, not good to punish your children. What? Then how will they ever learn to be in the world? Oh, right. That's why we have what's going on in the world right now. People who are making their problems everybody else's problems. All right. I hope that helped. And if you have any other questions, please let me know. And as always, please discern this message with God.